All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're at SousaCon24, and I am joined by my esteemed guest, David G. from Synadia. David, welcome. Thank you. Esteemed, I like that. I think that's the first time anybody's ever Anyone's, said esteemed. No, it's, I, think, I think it's fair to say. So you're with Synadia. Um, first time at KubeCon or, or Second time. Sorry? Second time yeah, at Yeah, so last year, first time around, which was fun. Mm. Although the venue this time is way open, so it yes. feels less intimate. Yes. But it's nice. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Munich was a bit, a bit tight last time. Like, I kind of liked it. Yeah? It just felt intimate. And you could wander through corridors and find random things. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Yeah. All right. So Synadia is known for a cu couple of things, but you're here to talk about NATS? Yeah, NATS and applied NATS. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So real quick, what what is NATS for, you know, you know the, the layman? For the layman. NATS is a million things. And that's their biggest problem with NATS. So for the sake of this talk, I'm going to be showing applied NATS, one of them around microservices and one around two node K3S. But what NATS is, is a message broker. It's a message broker with a lot of capabilities. So all the traditional things like request, reply and publish, subscribe, which is obviously developer centric, but then elevating above that, there is a persistence layer. And then we can do things like key value stores, object stores, data streaming. So from a real world analog, what we're really saying is like, ETCD, Redis, remove those things. We can do Kafka style operations. You don't need that. You can take MinIO out of the operation. What it really means in real world is one component can replace many components. And even at the infrastructure and orchestration level from a system point of view, we can not only provide signaling through the system, but all of the kind of data primitives required from modern application. And over the top of that, we have abstraction layers, which means then we can do things like microservices over the top. So it's not a microservices service mesh, although it's got a lot of the things needed to be able to do that. So NATS is really difficult to talk about sometimes. It's just an absolute nightmare, but it's, yeah, it's so many things, but what it is really, it's like a set of power tools for developers and operations, if that kind of makes sense. And that's kind of probably weird. It's not necessary just for infrastructure. So people talk about network overlays and things, but it, it's not a network overlay. It's really developer centric, but it's an enabling set of super tools, distributed foundations for building distributed applications. Can show us what that looks like? Sure. Yeah. Actually, what I was going to do is the title for this was just going to be, I think it was like two node and, and microservices. Thing is, I changed it to fun with NAS. Just for obviously fun with flags, a bit of a knock on from Big Bang, but let's face it, it can be pretty boring and dull sometimes. So we're here, obviously at SUSECon. We've been talking about two node K3S all week. So this is like a, an application that can go over the top of NAT. So K3S, I don't know nothing about this and nothing about what you do. So have you been talking to people about infrastructure? Have you been, you know, anything to do with K3S or kind of rancher? I mean, we, how does it look? How does the world look from your end? Oh, uh, well, I mean, me personally, I talk about K3S all the time. And awesome. even, even the guy behind the camera has been talking about K3S. So we're, we're pretty familiar with it. Pretty familiar. I like that. So two node K3S, what are your thoughts? I want to know how you're doing it, but I know the, I would understand the use case yep. because the use case at the edge would make sense for me. Cause I'm like, I can't afford, I mean, you know, it's the edge. You can't afford, you know, yep. a high availability is three, it's a little expensive Two, you can might get away with. I might as well hand over at this point and you can sell this back to me. Okay. Yeah. So this is absolutely all edge based. So if we, and what I've, I've been trying to like word this in a different way. So if we take say three servers at $10,000 each. And I'm aware my mass is going to be way off because I'm tired. I'm not coffeeed up enough. But then we could go to, say, a 1,000 nodes at 300 bucks each. Is that right? 200,000? No, hang on. That's way wrong. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, 1,000 nodes at 30 bucks each. There we go. Trying to not sound like a complete moron. We change the paradigm of what edge is. But when the use case changes, we go from big chunks of compute down to very, very small nodes, the application changes. So yesterday... In one of the sessions, we were talking about things like chicken fryers in KFC. Mm. So, you know, what data is important? Well, if you're in a bank and you're doing transactional stuff, you can't lose a payment. You mm. just can't. You know, like I, I know that when you check your bank balance, there is no gauge that says, you know, you've got minus $3,000. What it is, it's a reconciliation of all the transactions that give you that number. Mm -hmm. And they might store a snapshot, but systems are, are the same. You know, if you go and look at um, some edge use cases, what it might be is you might have a series of time series data or a series of events, you know, how many chickens you've killed through the fryer and how many things you've served up and the temperature tracks. Mm -hmm. So then the question comes, well, how reliable do you need this system to be and how much of this data do you need? So if the, if the problem space changes, so why, you know, why would you have a two node K3S system? Well, for high availability, survivability to, you know, if, if a machine is going to, I don't know, you've got a mean time between failure 
of what two years, three years, and you've got two machines. Hopefully, we can kind of game the system a little bit. So the hardware might be good for five years. So let's put some low-cost compute nodes on there to run the thing, and we can swap them out without any interruption to service. I think there's there's lots of different things here. It's not about elasticity, and it's not about just adding more crap. It's about survivability and continuous maintenance. So if we do this, two nodes makes absolutely sense because we get it in the neck all the time, you know, cap theorem and, oh, you can't do that, and quorum. But even when you have a quorum, a lot of engineers don't lean into it necessarily that much. They kind of go, well, I've, I've got an agreement. Yeah, but an agreement of what? What data's gone in? Do you check it? No. The system tells us we now have multiple copies. Yeah, but when you retrieve it, do you do a check on all nodes? No. You would just pull it from the, you know, the active node or whatever. Like, right, okay. So once we get over those hurdles, two nodes really is an edge, it's an edge play. It's a, you know, let's go to 10,000 sites and roll this technology out. And then how we're doing it, this is what we have now with the architecture. So we take K3S and Kine. We then create some patches. And what we've done is we've got an OSS patch for NAS. And then we've got some secret source around two node stuff. So we've built a dedicated two node leadership election engine. And all these two nodes do is they've got deterministic rule sets and, and they, they kind of have a conversation. And one of them says, well, I'm the leader and I've got the leadership flag. And if my conditions fail that allow me to make that decision, the other dude says, hey, now I'm the leader. And then what that does, that signals to the underlying system about state. So if you think about we have two applications, symmetric workload, the same thing, controlling. Again, the chicken fryer thing is a really nice use case. Two nodes, one's running the chicken fryer. And then let's say some, some IO goes wrong and this, the node says, crap, I'm, I'm, I'm impaired. I don't know what to do anymore. The other node will step in and say, my neighbor's having problems. I'm now going to step in and run the job. So you think, well, what's going to happen to the data at that point? Well, is it going to affect the machine? Because if there's a direct control loop between input and output decisions being made and the actuation on the machine and the other node steps in, you might have a blip of a few seconds whilst the other one kicks in and steps over. And then you've got the question of, well, what about the data? Well, how much data do you really want to back up about a chicken fryer? Are you trying to engineer out the, the, you know, the people dropping the fryers in? What are we trying to do? Are we sending information back to the manufacturer? It comes down to the use case. So if you lose, I don't know, a handful of measurements that haven't been backed up to the cloud or whatever, is it really a massive deal? And a lot of these conversations now going on around eventual consistency are happening are saying, well, is it really important if we capture every single piece of data where we can normalize the data anyway? And given the proliferation of AI, can we actually just smooth it out regardless? So costs are dropping on some of these things. So we can go from three nodes to two nodes because the edge application allows us to do that. With the, the system that we've got then, we have this lightweight leadership election thing with automatic failover of storage underneath. And what we have is we don't have two individual K3S systems. It's a resource pool. So we have two nodes that join as one. And then as soon as one of the nodes detects it's got problems, it just drops out the pool and the other one carries on, which means then you can also, you can use it for asymmetric workloads where you could have, say, the core applications duplicated on both nodes. But then let's say you have like, I don't know, like a reporting thing you can have it run on one node. And let's say if it, if it fails and collapses and, and one of the nodes takes over, it can then prioritize and schedule. It's basically it's just unmodified K3S on top. All we're doing is we're interfacing at the kind level with, with NATS itself. Now, are we using NATS as that data intermediary for that failover, like that, that blip and failover in that particular use case? Yeah, so we've got two independent instances of NATS. And then all of the signaling is done at the top level. So what happens is NATS takes care of the, all the data storage that goes through Kine and anything that you do, obviously at the YAML level, you know, when you push through Helm or what have you. And then NATS also takes care of all of the internal communication for the services that do the leadership detection and leadership election. And there's a lot. So actually what we have is we've got a single binary and I'm going to laugh now because my colleagues are going to be laughing at this. So every time somebody says single binary, we need like a button where fireworks come out of the ceiling or something. But we have um, a single binary and there's lots of communication passed internally and all of that goes through NATS. And then there's lots of key value stores. And the beautiful thing is all of the state system is ran by a KV store on NATS. So let's say you have applications, you want to know what node you're in. You don't need a specialized API. You can watch the KV and say, hey, if this changes, I want to know about it. So we, we've tried to engineer this. So it's very, very simple, requires no magic. The only magic is this, this leadership system at the top. And it sounds really, really simple, but it's took like months and months and months to try and get the gray area logic simplified enough for these kind of edge cases. Okay. That's interesting. So, I mean, I've got a, I don't know if you want to see this, I've got like a one minute 50 video where I can go through things yeah, and sure. show this stuff. So I'm just going to bounce around. It's probably going to mess up the, 
the video editing a little bit, but what I've got, let's try this. So you see, I've been demoing this all week as well. From the beginning, we have two nodes up. So one of the nodes is a leader, one of the, one of the nodes is follower. There's some basic configuration that happens. One of the nodes comes up biased to be a leader. One of the nodes is biased to come up as a follower. And all that means is if all of the detection around the leader fails, it will fail over to, to the follower. And we do some basic tests. So at the top, we can see probe local API is true. And all that means is there's an internal check. It checks the local K3S API to make sure it's online. Then there are some operating system checks. So that's kind of like run some arbitrary scripts. Is my disk okay? Do I have a GPU? Is a chicken fryer attached, for instance? And then we have network liveliness. So that's can I actually resolve my neighbor's, my neighbor IP's network interface and kind of see things like our pentries. And then I've got network neighbor liveliness. And there's a couple of checks there that's continuously ran. So ICMP reachability and then also HTTP checks to the neighbor's state page to gain all the key value remote information about its internal state. We've got hints around the finite state machine as well. So during development, you can imagine there's a lot of state handling. So it gives hints as to what it is. So today I'm a leader, I can be a follower if my role is reversed. And it will also give you different messages if it's impaired on actually what's gone wrong to give you, you know, troubleshooting hints as well. And then we've got transitioning. So if the system's actually detected something's changed and if, if it's decision matrix says, I need to now be a impaired system or a follower system, it will tell you what it's doing. And then once it, it does all these things, once it's stable and happy, and K3S is running underneath, it basically forms a single resource pool. So next, what we're gonna see, and I tried to do this yesterday in a demo and it kind of, it kind of, I think went okay. There's no workloads at the moment. So we've got basically a vanilla K3S two node system that comes up. So the first thing we do then is put Helm and HA proxy on there. We need HA proxy because we're using autonomic networking. So we are allowing the network to breathe and be itself through GARPs and things. So it's not exactly like, you know, signal networking all the way down. So we, we use HA proxy. And then the next thing you see here, you can just see that obviously that the kind of work lower it loads and the pods deploying. And straight after this, we then in the demo deploy Nginx. And all I'm doing here is Nginx is a really cheap and nasty web server. No other reason. It's just by default, you get a free web page, right? So we do, we deploy one of those. And then there's a virtual IP address as well that, that comes up and you can turn it off if you like. So when you're running symmetric workloads and only one of them needs to be active at any given moment, with the VIP, it will use a Linux netlink, put the IP address on the system, and then it will update the network and basically say, hey, I'm the node, the leader node with the VIP, which means on the last screen we saw there, you can actually see the web server is now alive on the VIP and it's running on the system. Now, what will happen, and as per my typing in here, at this moment in time, I disconnect node one and just kill it. I take it off the network. And then what we see next, on the left-hand side, we see the spinner of doom. And on the right-hand side, you can actually begin to see some state transitions. So what we'll see here is my neighbor will go to false and then we'll see transitioning will move. And then you see the posture hint and then we've transitioned now to a leader RX state. And what that means is basically I was a follower, I'm now a leader. And then it only takes a few seconds, the VIP moves across and then basically the, the system carries on working. So, and there we go, I mean, that was like what, three, five seconds, maybe something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the end of that. Um, but it was, I guess all this kind of makes it look fairly simple, but it was, just months and months and months of trying to make sure A, we were doing the right thing. B, we're not going to get shot against the wall for, you know, upsetting all the computer scientists. But what's began to happen in the last 12 months is we've been told of use cases of like 10,000 a time. Mm -hmm. And you can't help but feel with something simple like this, certainly for the edge use cases as systems just continue to drop in size, that exactly like what happened in the embedded space where you take a small system, you have a hypervisor, you do an over the air update, you grab the whole image and you throw it down. So for machines, again, that, you know, got to be in production for 10 years or whatever, I think this approach makes total sense. And so instead of having one, you know, embedded board, that's going to be error, you know, error prone, you might have two systems, just run them. And if one goes down on swap it out and bring it back up. And then there's all sorts of easy maintenance things we've added in as well to just kind of make this whole thing easier. Very cool. Now there's a lot of complexity that you yes. raised over, right? So, massively so. <laughs> massively so. So as we're starting to wrap up. Where could someone learn more about what Nats can do and some proper, because as a former developer, I look at this as a, I can get in trouble with this. Like I, I, I can, I can, yeah. I, like you get, it's kind of giving me like, you know, putting a toddler in a, in a, in a hardware store, right? That kind you, of, you'll the, learn loads out, won't you? yeah. So, <laughs> so where can, where can a developer or an engineer go learn more, learn some about some of these 
yeah. best practices of, you know, here's what we're, you know, saying we, sh you should, how you should be using that. Where can they find out more? Not just for, you know, the, the, the marketing stuff, but like, you know, mm -hmm. this is something where they need to take it, be able to take it for a spin. Yeah, that's, that's, that's totally fair. So best places, the nats.io website typically is where the OSS or open source project is found. Nats is OS for, OSS first, even get my words out. If you head over to there, we have extensive examples, details buried all over the, the, the code base as well. Um, we've got natsbyexample.com. So we've got lots of patterns that you can just take for a spin most of the time in your favorite programming language. But you might imagine that Nats is continually being worked on. We've got a very large community. And Nats mm -hmm. has been around for a considerable amount of time now. And people say, well, it's brand new. It's been around the same length, time length as Kafka. So it's not new. Oh, it just moves relatively fast and it's massively performant. So if we talk about Nats at the most fundamental level, you get all the, the primitives from messaging. Mm -hmm. So request, reply, pub, sub, which is great. You know, you can take your application and make it multi-region, multi-cloud without any tricks. Mm -hmm. It just works out of the box. We then put all the data primitives on. So the KV, the object store, the data streaming, and the streaming really is the, the, the primitive and the KV and the object store are built on top of that. So from a systems point of view, you can begin to reduce your component count. But again, all of these use cases, NATS.io and then NATSbyExample.com. But around the commercial side, what we find is I love the way that you just said you could get into a lot of trouble with this. We find that every engagement that we have, everybody has already gone into trouble. They've gone ahead and from their mind, from the training, they've gone and designed something distributed. Mm -hmm. And then we've gone in and, and they put the fail safes and the checks in the wrong place, or they built something where they've created their own bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. So what we go in is remove things, simplify things, tip the design upside down, put the back pressure onto NATS, basically reduce the complexity of your source code in your application. So NATS takes the hit from the checks and balances and doing the right thing. And then we've got patterns like over the top of a stream, you might have like a work queue, mm -hmm. things like that to make your life easier and scheduling and all sorts of things. Interesting. So from a developer point of view, you've got so much goodness to get going. And I know it's going to sound very cliche, but the reason I'm at Synadia is because I use NATS enough where it changed the way I build things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't convince anybody to do this anymore. I just need to go and work with the people that are doing it. And then now when we build things, all of us are the, are the kind of same, you know, kind of hate the cliche or love it. It genuinely changes what you build and how you build. Nice, nice, nice. Well, David, thank you very much for coming thank and you. we'll see everybody else in the community.